Welcome to a new episode of Juan's World and I'm going to be continuing my series on unpacking Christmas. It's January 3rd and for most people Christmas is over. It's not over for me. There are 12 days of Christmas. And today I want to talk about the so-called war on Christmas. Well, the war on Christmas that many of the right-wing pundits in particular have claim is going on is, of course, complete nonsense. If you wander around the streets of New York or London any time from about November 1st onwards, you know that if there is a war on Christmas, then the war is failing miserably. But I'm going to suggest that there is a war on Christmas, and it comes from the very people who are complaining about this war on Christmas, but it's a different war. That is, it's a war, as far as I'm concerned, on what is at the heart of Christmas, and it's a war waged by merchants, by people who want your money, by people who are trying to get something for themselves. And supposedly, the point of Christmas, in a, I, I will ramble on about this at length at some point, but the central essence of Christmas is hope and joy and peace and love and that we're supposed to bring goodwill. And <laughs> I'm not sure how much of that gets spread around. So I want to talk about first the fake war on Christmas, which is not a war at all, and then I want to talk about the real war on Christmas. Um, well, I wouldn't really call it a war, more like an assault or an attack, uh, a perversion, and let's get into it. Now, the phony war on Christmas is a scare tactic. It's fear spread by people who f feel like their culture is somehow endangered. That they want to be able to say Merry Christmas to people and somehow or other they're being forbidden. Well, there's some people who are sensitive, perhaps oversensitive, who don't want to offend anybody by saying Merry Christmas if it turns out they're Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or something. And so they say happy holidays. And this enrages white nationalists, Donald Trump, and all the Fox News people. And it's all just nonsense. There's no reason why you can't say Merry Christmas. You can say Merry Christmas to a Jew or a Hindu <laughs> and they won't mind. Um, oh, they will mind if you force it down their throats. Say, I don't want you being Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist because my tradition is the best tradition and I want to say Merry Christmas and I want to say that my culture is the best culture so I'm going to say it and I don't care about you. Well, you know, if you do that, then you're a pig. But I don't, I don't avoid saying Merry Christmas to people. Um, I don't think it offends people if I say it. But I also say, 
Eid Mubarak to Muslims during Eid. Even though I'm not Muslim, they're celebrating the end of Ramadan and I'm happy to be celebratory with them. I don't celebrate it, but I'm happy to wish them a celebration or Happy Hanukkah or Rosh Hashanah for Jews. I don't mind. I don't mind if they if they wish it to me. It's not it's not offensive. What's offensive is insisting that your holiday is the true and only correct one at this particular time of the year and that you're going to make everybody value it as much as you do. Well, that's what we call ethnocentric. That just means that you are forcing your culture on other people and that is just wrong. Okay, so that's that's the whole war on Christmas thing. I'll have something about political correctness in another video. What I want to do now is focus on Christmas celebrations. Now, I would say that there is a real war on Christmas, <laughs> although, I mean, I wouldn't use the term war, but I'd say there's an attack, an assault on Christmas, but it comes not from these white nationalists and their uh, taking offense at political correctness or whatever you want to call it. It's from the people who call themselves Christians because Christmas has been hijacked by the merchants. And that's why we have this uh, stormtroop down towards Christmas with buy, 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 um, buy a Christmas tree, buy ornaments, buy lights, buy gifts, buy, spend lots of money, spend too much money. That's an attack on Christmas. That's a big attack on Christmas because that's not what the Christmas message is all about. Sure, the Magi brought gifts for Jesus, but that's not where it started really. It started in the 19th century. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is how the Christmas that we celebrate now came about and why it's a perversion of what Christmas can be and why my version of unpacking Christmas, I feel, is more satisfying. Now you'll hear a lot of nonsense from people saying Christmas is really the solstice celebration or it's Saturnalia or some other quote-unquote pagan tradition and not really a Christian celebration at all. Also nonsense. Christmas, the heart of Christmas, is a Christian tradition. It has accumulated a lot of other traditions around it, but the center of it is the nativity. And the nativity is fundamentally a Christian tradition. I've talked in previous videos about how I don't think the nativity in Bethlehem actually happened, but that's the tradition that is Christian. But there are many other cultures in Europe that celebrated the winter solstice. Also nonsense talked about how, you know, stupid people in the past, because everybody in the past, we all know oh, we're stupid because they don't believe what we believe. And, you know, we're rational and we're scientific and they were all superstitious and magical and also nonsense. But the old false notion was that pagan people believed the sun was going away and going away and going away and it might go completely away unless we paid homage and had sacrifices and lit bonfires on hilltops and then the sun would say okay I've got to come back well that's just rubbish we've known Archaeologists have known that for thousands of years before the birth of Christ, people had very sophisticated astronomical uh, readings and that they knew the sun was coming back. <laughs> that, that has nothing to do with anything except modern 
you know, stupid superstition. But just because we know the sun's coming back doesn't mean we can't be sorry that it's going away and build fires. Now, what better thing to do when it's really cold and snowing and you are feeling miserable than to light a bonfire and have a party? You know, try to make things better until the winter is beginning to turn when the days are just getting a little bit longer. So the solstice is on the 21st. By the 25th, we are aware that the days are getting longer and we can start celebrating. Spring is on the way. Right? It's no problem for me. And the fact that the birth of Jesus was artificially placed at that point makes a lot of sense in terms of religion, in terms of ritual. I've talk, talked a lot about how the actual nativity is not historically accurate or verifiable, but the idea that your hope was born in the darkest, coldest time of the year, that makes a lot of spiritual sense. Now, there were also plenty of other pagan or non-Christian traditions associated with midwinter. That's true, like bringing evergreen uh, leaves and boughs into the house, holly and ivy, fir trees. Yeah. Those were all traditions that were knocking around long before Christmas. And Christmas adopted them. No problem. But it's not fair to say that Christmas is those old traditions. It's much better to say that there was synchronism, that is a, a union of old traditions and the Christmas tradition. All right, so that's point one. Just because we have the Easter bunny and Easter eggs at Easter doesn't mean that Easter is somehow a pagan tradition of fertility of rabbits and eggs. Rabbits and eggs were also spring festival traditions that got attached to Easter, but the Easter story is purely Christian. The Christmas story is purely Christian. The end. All right. Now let's move on to Christmas in the modern world. The modern tradition of Christmas is largely attributable to Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol mostly, although he wrote a lot of Christmas stories, because Dickens was deeply concerned that Christmas was not being celebrated enough. And so he wrote a lot of Christmas stories and Christmas Carol was the one that happened to be picked up on most, but he wrote rafts of Christmas stories. There was a tradition in Victorian England of telling ghost stories on Christmas. I'm not sure why, but that's what is at the heart of Christmas Carol. There's three ghosts, Christmas ghosts, and one other ghost. There's Marley's ghost, and then there's the Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come. And what Dickens was trying to do was to reinvigorate a celebration that he felt was getting moribund. And unfortunately, he succeeded <laughs> rather more than we all might like. And he succeeded in a way that I certainly do not like at all. You see, what's happened now is that Christmas has been hijacked by people who want to sell you things. And they'll sell you lights and decorations and trees, artificial trees, and, and you'll see this throughout the world. You know, I've lived in uh, parts of Southeast Asia, China, where Christmas is not a tradition at all, historically, but merchants, Get, hold on to it and pervade the environment with uh, 
trees and reindeer and fake snow and all those kinds of things because they want to make money. And what I, in fact, cannot understand is how it has got so out of control, particularly in the United States and in Great Britain. In Argentina, when I spent my first Christmas in Argentina, I had to kind of switch gears because it's the middle of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. And so the whole symbolism is lost. <laughs> the days aren't getting longer, they're getting shorter. And it's really hot. The first time I walked the streets of Buenos Aires on Christmas Eve, it was 50 degrees. I thought I was going to melt. But here's the thing. In Buenos Aires, they start celebrating Christmas around the Immaculate Conception, which is the 8th of December. They put up a few decorations, very few. Yeah, mostly, again, shops, um, bakeries will have lots of displays of Christmas items like pan dulce, um, what they call panettone in Italy, a kind of sweet bread that's associated with, um, uh, with Christmas and various other things. Uh, empanadas that have uh, fruit in them. Very little in the way of gift giving. I went down to Galerias Pacifico, which was very close to my apartment at the time, not very long before Christmas. A mall, a mall where in the United States you can't even get parking. Uh, people are driving around the parking lot for 20 minutes trying to find a parking space. I went to Galerias Pacifico, empty. Just a few people wandering around, nobody doing very much. And when I celebrated Christmas with my friends and family, they exchanged almost no gifts at all. Very small tokens. I, my one Christmas present in my seven years in Argentina was a key ring. That's the only present I got. I had tons of friends and I gave a few presents of the same sort. Just very low key because they're interested in celebrating Christmas as a family tradition. And what they do is they all get together on Christmas Eve and everything is closed. Everything. You won't find a restaurant, a bar, a shop, a government office. Nothing is open on Christmas Eve. And foreign businesses like the fast food chains like McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, they all want to be open. They all want to be making money. And too bad, they have tried year in, year out, double wages, even triple wages. And Argentinos just won't, won't take it. They want to be at home with family on Christmas Eve because Christmas Eve is the big day. On Christmas Eve, everyone goes home they have an asado, you know, the uh, Argentine version of barbecue, except a big piece of meat. They work on it all day, and it's usually pork. Rest of the year it's beef, but on Christmas it's pork. They cook it during the day, and they cool it down so they can have it cold on Christmas Eve, late. Dinner usually starts sometime around 10 or even 11 o'clock, and they have cold meat, um, salad, sometimes different kinds of salad, and ice cream and fruit. And at midnight, they toast with champagne. They give the little gifts that they have bought, and then they let off fireworks. And every individual <laughs> practically in the whole city buys armfuls of fireworks and they go out in the streets and they let them off for hours and hours and hours. Two, three hours. And then they keep drinking, they keep eating, and they finally go to bed at dawn and sleep most of Christmas Day 
and then when they get out, things on Christmas Day are back to normal. Shops start opening, uh, restaurants, bars, everything. Still celebratory, but um, not like Christmas Eve. Whereas Christmas in the United States and in the United Kingdom has become this gigantic festival of greed and mercantilism. Now to me, that's the war on Christmas because it has nothing to do with the nativity. It just has to do with how much a merchant can make. That's why the day after Thanksgiving is called Black Friday because that's the day when the accounts go from being in the red, in debt, to being in the black, that is, in profit. And if a store does not profit in the Christmas season, it can't survive. It can, it can lose money, say, nine or ten months of the year, but it has to make all of its money at Christmas time. And so that's what we know now as Christmas, and that's what I call the war on Christmas, because it doesn't look at what Christmas is in essence. This is why I want to unpack Christmas, because I want to get rid of all that stuff. I want to get rid of the greed and the buying and present frenzy. I still want to give presents, a few. I give presents to a few friends and to my sisters, and I don't spend a lot of money. I don't have a tree. I've got some decorations up this year because I had a house guest. I always have something up, but I actually bought some lights and a little more tinsel. I have some tinsel on my balcony outside. Um, I buy special foods. I like to make Christmas pudding, uh, mince pies, sausage rolls, cockaliki soup. You know, there's things I like to do because I think of this, the year as a time for seasonal cooking. Cook winter foods in the winter, summer foods in the summer. If you want to have strawberries at Christmas, well, go ahead. But I'm going to have strawberries when they're ripe in season. So in the United States or the United Kingdom, they're in season in May, and that's when I'm going to have strawberries. In, in the Christmas season, I'm going to have preserved fruits, crystallized fruits that are traditional, that have been made for centuries uh, because that's what we have at this time of year. We don't have, or oh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, Cambodia. Right now you get what you want, mangoes, pineapples, coconuts. But I'm being you know, personally traditional. Um, thinking about my heritage. So there it is. The war on Christmas is f coming from the very people who are complaining about the war on Christmas because they're not thinking about what the message of Christmas really is. It's a message of hope. A little baby was born in a humble place, but he brought great things. And that's what we need to be thinking about. So next time I'm going to talk much, much more about my interpretation of the Greek Bible and why I last time talked about why I think Luke and Matthew are just making up the stories of Christmas, but why nonetheless the stories have value. But I also want to look more closely at how we can interpret the Gospels in particular as history. Like what in them is genuine history and what is made up. But that's for next time. Now, like subscribe, and have a continued happy Christmas all the way to the January 6th Epiphany. Merry Christmas.